welcome to another episode of Nolzer's Marvelous Tutorials with Realm Smith. I am your host, Jason Azevedo, as usual. Um, some of you may have heard me say, Bruno, stop, before we started in the pre-roll. And I did that because he is chewing his paws. He's got allergies really bad. And I feel for the guy. Deeply feel for the guy. And so I have asked him to stop, but that's okay. Welcome to another episode. We're super excited to be here as usual. Um, we are painting the Grick tonight, both the Grick Alpha and the uh, regular Grick. We had a Grick in um, in Into the Mist, Curse of Strahd so far. So we're going to paint one up just in case it happens to come back at some point, maybe. Anyways, so that's that. You could probably hear Bruno going at his paws in the background here. Buddy. Um, my leg. Uh, I know you guys have been asking about how my leg's doing. Let me show you if I can... Uh, how my leg's doing. That is how my leg is doing right now. It's not great. Um, I thought it was sprained, folks. I fractured it. Uh, I went over on my ankle so hard, actually, that, um, that I actually... The ligament... When my, um, when my ankle kind of turned, the ligament pulled a piece of bone flake off my bone. Uh, and so, yeah, the struggle is real. So anyways, uh, but I'm healing and I have a boot on and still going about life as much as I can uh, considering the situation, which is okay, right? We do what we do. Want to thank Dungeons and Dragons as usual for having us on their channel. Whiz kids for all the incredible miniatures, including including this awesome Grick that they've created that I haven't even still put out of the package. That's how new it is. Um, I'm gonna do that as well. And to Vallejo, of course, for sponsoring the channel, being our main title sponsor, uh, and for sending these the, us these awesome paints that we use on a weekly basis. They are so great and so good. Uh, and I think I might start with the with the Alpha, which is a large Grick. That one's kind of scary. The ones that the party faced was just a regular medium-sized Grick. So I'm also going to put the color here. A couple quick announcements before we start. As usual, um, tomorrow night, Into the Mist, episode four? Is it three or four? Why does my brain not work yet? Episode one was Matt Mercer. Episode two was Bone Grinder. Episode three, episode four. <laughs> It'll be episode four. Thank you, Sakura. <laughs> oh, man. It has been a week, folks. Uh, I'm just seeing four show up. Episode four of Into the Mist. We're very excited about it. It's going to be a blast, especially because we're going to have the one and the only Matthew Lillard on the show again as Rictavio, along with Esmeralda, played by Nora, and the rest of our wonderful cast. Um, so pumped. Uh, and it's going to be great. I see lots of Roros, Roros, and Zoinks in the, in the chat. Um, Matt is a great, great guy, wonderful guy. Just so you all know, they announced their Curse of Strahd legendary box from Beetle and Grimm. It is insanity. That's what they've been talking about all of Gen Con. Uh, Joel and I were on their channel. Check them out at twitch.tv slash beetlingrims. Uh, and you can see all the info. We were we had a little interview with them to talk about Into the Mist, the coming season. Matt's going to be on our show for at least a couple episodes. Um, and the box is ridiculous, folks. Uh, it's got all kinds of giveaways and handouts and little finger puppets by Blink Blinsky and all that stuff. So please check it out. It is unreal, um, and everyone's going to want a copy of that Be uh, Beetle and Grimm um, box. Uh, it is awesome. So check that out as soon as you get the chance to do so, uh, because you don't want to miss out on that opportunity. I think they've sold, like, hundreds and hundreds of them so far. Um, so we're so happy um, with those guys, and happy for those guys, because they're amazing. And like-minded creators, much like we are. Uh, when it comes to unadulterated immersion and just making sure that we get people right. I feel like my camera is crooked, but maybe not. Maybe it's just my monitor. Anyways, um, Tuesday, of course, behind the screen with me, we can talk about Matt Lillard and all his wonderfulness uh, and the rest of the cast. And then Thursday, Player's Table with Joel Oje. Joel actually played some clips last week and then talked through those moments. Uh, 
I have been asking him to hopefully do that again. So hopefully he will, because it was pretty awesome. Um, indeed. Let me just think this through for a second. If there's anything else announcement-wise, I don't think there is um, at all at the moment. So let's just go on with the show, shall we? Tools of the Trade, of course, as usual. The Grick by a D&D, or by Whiskers, rather. Uh, the D&D, &D, uh, it says Flesh Golem because I didn't change that because I forgot. But that is the Grick and the Grick Alpha. Um, maybe I can blame my busted ankle, but probably not. All the paints we'll need for tonight. We have heavy green and caiman green, which will be used for the back of the Grick. The belly will be using heavy brown, sepia wash, some pale yellow probably, and some bone white. Uh, we'll be using heavy ochre mixed with pale yellow for the beak, and then heavy blue gray for the base, and then a variety of washes, including a rosy flesh and a flesh wash for the inside of the Grick's mouth. Um, we're super pumped about it. All right, here we go. Hopefully the camera here doesn't freak out too much. It's been stalling the last couple weeks, but hopefully we've addressed that uh, effectively um, for that. So anyways, here we go. Uh, here is the Alpha. It is huge. It is wonderful. Actually, we fixed the lighting in here too, so you guys can see minis a lot better, I think, with the new lighting in the studio. So that's the Alpha. That is the regular Grick, kind of the medium size, and I'll put it beside uh, Irina from our stream just to give you a sense of, of scale. So that is a medium size figure next to all of these creatures. That Grick Alpha is scary sauce. I'm gonna start on that Grick Alpha um, with its back color, I think. Um, no, you know what? I'm gonna start with the belly because that's gonna be a lot messier than the back. So we are going to start with Heavy Brown. And that is an extra opaque color from Vallejo. You can see that this bottle is well used and well squeezed. Uh, and we're just gonna put some of that on our palette. Like that, put a bunch into a number two a brush or load our number two brush with that. Always use a little bit of water just to help it to flow. And then what we're gonna do is paint it into all the recesses on that belly and make sure that we get a nice solid base coat on that. Um, one thing to remember, of course, with extra opaques is they are designed to go on in one coat and they do a great job of doing that. They are magic uh, and everybody raves about it. So anyways, we're gonna do that across the entire uh, belly area of this Grick. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do with the tentacles in the mouth, the mouth tentacles, the mouthicles. Tentamouth, tent, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what we're gonna do with those yet because I think in the imagery, they're kind of green still. Uh, they're kind of similar to the underbelly. So I may actually, you know what? I may actually do that. I may actually start with the underbelly color in there as well. We'll do that. And we're gonna do similar colors across. We're basically, basically batch painting the two gricks um, so that we're saving time by not switching colors between the minis um, so that we can make sure that we're maximizing paint and time. So as soon as I'm done all the heavy brown on this guy, I'll move on while that's drying to the, and you save drying time too. And then we'll move on to all the heavy brown on this guy. And then we'll just go back and forth as we do. We'll just bring up all of our questions on here. Also playing our uh, Hopeless Village set, sound set from Sirenscape. You can check it out at www.sirenscape.com. Um, I think I'm gonna go back to the Death House. I don't know if I have a grip, a Grick sound set. I don't think we, we added a Grick in there. Um, no. But we do have the catacombs, so I'm going to switch to the catacombs. Oh, that's good. Oh, we have the, the chanting that happens in the catacombs. It's great. Isn't that fun? Anyways, you can check that out at sirenscape.com. You can purchase it yourself for your own Curse of Strahd game. so fun 
Okay. All right. Questions for today. Our wonderful mods are writing them down for me, so this is great. Okay. One question I think moved over from the player's table that Joel wanted me to answer, I remember. Main, uh, from Nam Carver, mainly for the DMs at the table, are there certain race class combos that you don't allow? No, I haven't. There hasn't been anything that I've said, nope, not good to go. Um, I like my approach, you know, even before streaming, but my approach to DMing has always been, I want the players to play what they will find fun. And if you can make that happen at the table, so say, you know, somebody comes and says, I want to play a mermaid or, you know, whatever, um, then I would do my best to take to help them find the best, you know, race and class combo that I could find for them to be able to do that to the best of their ability within the rules. Um, so there isn't really a race class combo yet that I've said no to. Uh, even Unearthed Arcana we allow... I probably wouldn't allow anything that isn't in some way, shape, or form official D&D content just because uh, D&D Beyond is a sponsor and we use that at the table and I use that to kind of track things and it would be difficult to use kind of like maybe an antiquated class that doesn't exist anymore or something like that. Uh, but we would try our best to find the equivalent of that in the existing kind of rule set. Maybe it's different feats or abilities that we can add or, or whatever. So, um, you know, oftentimes what I'll tell people when they come to my table or when we find somebody and add them to the, we add somebody new to the, um, to the live stream, to the cast, what we'll say is something like, you know, especially for people who have never played D&D &D before. Um, so I said this to Christina uh, and I kind of said this to Melanie as well when she started and even David when he started. But what I say is, you know, Think of a character from popular fiction and that you like, like that is fun, one of your favorite superheroes or movie characters or whatever. <laughs> you know, I'll be like, you know, have you watched Lord of the Rings? Yes. Well, who's a character that really resonates with you? If they say Legolas, then, you know, Wood Elf kind of um, ranger makes sense. Um or something like that. Uh, that's what I'll typically do, and then we'll work from there. So, anyways. That's why I say that, you know, anything that's official content, even if it is Unearthed Arcana, I'll usually allow it. Because I want the player to be comfortable playing what they're playing and not have to force something that doesn't come naturally. Um, okay, Krug2227. Uh, oh, I will also say, if you like what you see tonight, make sure that you subs comment and subscribe. Um, we are uh, we have a lot of fun on this channel. For those of you that are new, we do this show, which is Mo Nozer's Marvelous Tutorials, where we paint a D&D &D mini uh, by WizKids every Sunday. Uh, but then we also have live actual plays, so where we play through D&D, &D, a bunch of my friends and I, um, on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. And um, it's a blast, and we love it, and we uh, do it on a weekly basis. Um, and we can't believe it's we, you know, something we can do for a living uh, and uh, professionally, which is pretty nuts, uh, and such a blessing and an honor to be able to do that. But we've, you know, the the channels have actually exploded lately. We've seen massive growth in the last couple weeks. Um, I think people really are digging the um, premiere with Matt Mercer, and it is bringing massive traffic to our channels uh, because of it and we're getting massive views across uh, YouTube and then in turn on on Twitch so I want to thank everyone for your continued support because it's really really awesome um, uh, and I wanted to just say that also if you subscribe to our channel um, you also entered into um, our online discord role-playing community and what that is is it's a place on our discord channels that allows people to role play uh, in text and in character and then also go on quests as the vistani from barovia uh, from the curse of strad campaign uh, and if you you uh if you subscribe at different tiers you get different uh bonuses uh different levels 
uh, but you can subscribe using Twitch Prime, um, which obviously is through Amazon Prime and costs you nothing, helps us to do what we do. And then you can go ahead and role play with these awesome camps that we have on our Discord that plays alongside of the players in our actual play live stream of Curse of Strahd. Uh, and that is just a blast. Um, and even last week, we had a bit of a Easter egg where the players were kind of passing one of the camps and from the tree line heard an interaction that actually happened in the Discord a few days or a day before. So um, super fun. Man, Bruno is just going to town, and it kind of sounds like a Grick eating, so I'm actually not that mad at him right now. I think it's adding to the ambiance. Can you guys hear Bruno? Can you guys hear Bruno just chewing at his paws? Poor guy. He's just allergic to everything. We're trying to figure it out. I do need a Grick costume for Bruno. That'd be great, actually. Oh, man, you got to hear that. It Honestly, I'm going to record this him doing this and then maybe we'll put it into one of our sound sets for Sirenscape <laughs> uh, definitely let me know if you can hear him because it is something else this this sound he's making okay so I've base coated all of the heavy brown that's all done don't know why this Grix not fitting into my holder anymore all of a sudden come on there we go okay uh, after that I'm hoping that this is going to dry fairly quickly. It usually does, although it's uh, cooler in here today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start to paint the back. Uh, and for the back, I am going to use Heavy Green, which is a, another great extra opaque paint. And that'll be a great kind of base for... Not really, poor for baby. Okay, so we can't really hear him. That's good. But if you could, it, it's hilarious. All right. Krug227, comment. Just wanted to say how much of an inspiration you have been as I'm running Curse of Strahd for the first time. Thank you for what you guys do. Come on now, guys. Y'all gonna make me misty. Man, there is no greater compliment for me. Uh, and I, I am getting a little kind of... There's no greater compliment for me, uh, and maybe for anybody, than to say that you've inspired somebody. Um, for me, that is kind of one of the best... Best compliments and uh, is why I do this. Um, yes, it's fun. And yes, we have sponsors. And yes, I can do it for a living um, and, and all of that. But guys, I can't tell you how, how much more it means to me that we can affect people's lives on a kind of weekly basis. And I know that sounds silly and, and maybe sounds silly to, to, to some of you out there. And it's D&D. &D, it's just a game or whatever. But I'll tell you the amount of, so not just inspiring from a gameplay perspective, and that's wonderful, and I'm so glad that, that you guys can learn something from us playing and get a better understanding of how to kind of bring the game to your table and your, and your people, but even more so than that, um, just knowing that, um, just knowing that we can literally be kind of a bit of a, a support network for people um is is huge it's huge and you know we've gotten multiple endless not endless but multiple and i mean dozens and dozens of messages since we started this thing of people saying you know your your you know your shows are what get get me through a week the week and i can't tell you how how much that means and um and yeah, I, I, that's, I, yeah, it's just so special and heartwarming to us here um, at Realm Smith. And frankly, pushes us. I don't know what Bruno now. He ran upstairs. He's barking at the door. But I can't tell you how much hearing that and knowing how important this is to you guys pushes us to be better and, and bring our A game to 
to the table every week in everything that we do. So, uh, guys, I can't I can't tell you enough how how much that means. All right, that's my little misty rant. Um, from the D and D chat and Trobe nineteen, still need a Dave versus Joel fight. We do, don't we? And I don't mean Dave versus Joel because we don't want to see that happen. Although I have my bets. Uh, <laughs> but I want to see uh, what Trobe nineteen is talking about. Is he's suggesting, you know, somebody suggested that we should do a kind of like a versus night where we have Falfer versus Muskoka in like a fight pit a la like UFC style where where they you know they go at it in a fight pit and we see who wins um, I've been thinking about doing a stream like that for a while and it's something I think that would be a lot of fun so maybe we do maybe we start something like that it would be a blast man it would be a blast. This heavy green is going on very well. This is a bit of a time consuming step as, you know, I'm making sure now, I wasn't too careful with the heavy brown. I am being more careful now with the heavy green because I don't want to cover the heavy brown. I want to make sure that I kind of stop. There's a little ridge that run, runs along the kind of the the middle of of the brick. Um, but so good. So good. <sighs> oh. All right. All right, next question. Krug two 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 seven. Two 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 seven. Are these miniatures already primed? The answer to that question is yes, Krug. They're absolutely all WizKids minis come pre-primed. Um, primed, paint ready out of the box, it says here. And literally, you saw me kind of open up the box and go, and they're pretty awesome that way. Uh, I love one of the kind of banes of my painting existing is priming. Um, just because, again, you can't really prime inside the house um, and all of that. And it just, you know, in the winter, it kind of sucks. So these come pre-primed. You can paint right onto the miniature, uh, and they do very well. Um, but if you do need to prime your minis, uh, or if you want to, if it's a character that is a certain color, like basically um, primarily a certain solid color, then I have the Vallejo spray primers that are colored. And so even though it's pre-primed, you know, if I were to do a large creature that is predominantly gray, for example, or dark, I would pre-prime or I would prime that that miniature with a uh, colored gray primer from Vallejo, uh, for example, just to kind of be able to cover it quickly, get the base coat down, and then go from there. So they're awesome primers. Uh, and then I also was asked, I've been asked lately about how I do my um, varnishing. This is the varnish I use. It's acrylic matte varnish from Vallejo. It's really great. Um, and it goes on thick, but it, cl it, it dries completely clear uh, and matte. So it's pretty awesome that way. Um, and it's a really great primer. It's the primer I choose to use. Or sorry, not the primer. It's a really great varnish. It's the varnish I choose to use. Uh, but you can also use the Vallejo uh, brush, brush primers, uh, sorry, brush varnishes as well, the brush on varnishes, which come in little bottles. And Bruno is still going at his paws, which is probably just something we're going to have to live with. But again, it kind of sounds like a grick, so we're just going to leave it. 
know what I'm saying? Alright. Okay, so that, oops, sorry for hitting the camera. That there is, we're kind of stopping at the top there because I did find that in the, yeah, on here too, but in the, um, in the monster manual, they do have a kind of like a spike at the end of these tentacle things. So I'm just gonna leave the last one that color, that brown, which is why I kind of painted around it a little bit at the top there. Because I wanted to leave that the way it was. Almost done this color here. All right. Uh, Good day, Crystal asks. I am trying to convert a story into D&D content on D&D Beyond, and I was curious if you would be willing in the future to make a tutorial on how to do so. Or if you can't, if you have any video suggestions that could help. The ones I have found have not helped much. I'm trying to convert a story into D&D into content on D&D Beyond. Um, Dag, if you could just kind of uh, explain a little further what you mean by story. Um, are you talking so you can make it kind of like downloadable content? Um, for others to use, uh, I'm just trying to kind of understand what, what that is. So if you could just give me some clarity there, hopefully I can, I can, uh, I can clarify or expand for you there. That'd be great. All right. Awesome. Okay. So that is that. Those two kind of tentacle thingies are done. The base coat. I mean, these are really great. If you guys just want to base coat these, you can do that too, right? You don't necessarily have to go to the next step. Even base coating them looks really good. R. Burnham, have you done a Tiefling Sorcerer? I have. No, I have not painted a Tiefling Sorcerer, if that's something you'd like to see. Uh, I love taking uh, requests here on the show. So if that's something you'd like to see, I'll put that in the potential list of things that we'll do next. Um, I haven't done a Tiefling Sorcerer. I did do a Tiefling rogue that was played by i can't remember but they were played by someone in founders and legends last year um that was the game it was the main game dm'd by luke gygax and um matt mercer played in it uh and eric from um Idle Champions played in it, and Deborah Ann Wall and TJ Storm and a bunch of others played in it, and I can't remember who played the Tiefling Rogue, but I did a Tiefling Rogue, and it was fun. But maybe I will do a Tiefling Sorcerer. I actually picked one up today, um, like out of the box of two paint minis, and, oh, wait a second. I have to find out if that's actually green. It is green, okay, on the bottom as well. It looks like it is, so we're just going to say it is. There we go. Perfect. And if you guys want to just, uh, if you want to suggest some minis we can paint, um, just do that in a comment in the chat. So I'm not looking at the whole chat. I'm just looking at the questions that the mods send me because it's just easier while I'm painting to, to kind of look at my list here. Um, but if you guys have suggestions, Write comment in um, caps and, oops, went over a bit. Just write comment in caps and we will, the mods will be gracious enough to add them to the chat, to the list here. And I can, uh, I'd love to see what you guys want us to paint. If there's any suggestions you guys have for future content. For Nolzers. There isn't much I don't have. The... Um, also known as the Crafting Muse, who works at with WizKids, at WizKids, um, sent me a buttload of minis that I didn't have. So I have most of the WizKids minis now, which are, are great and awesome. And she's awesome. So chances are I have it. If I don't, I can ask for it. 
Okay, so that's going to dry now. That is the heavy brown. On the other side, I'm also going... Oh, sorry, that is the heavy green on the, on the back side. This one's going to be much quicker to do. Um, these are, just so you guys can... For those of you that haven't seen them yet, these are the adult dragons from WizKids that are coming out. That is the white. You can see the size of it. Give you a bit of a size comparison. So yeah, you think the, the Greek Alpha is scary. Put them next to that bad boy. And you can see that size difference there. Uh, it's pretty crazy. So that's the white one. And then they also have the uh, Sapphire Dragon as well, which is huge and awesome. So cool. I don't know, Bruno's hearing something. Bruno, what is it, buddy? Somebody at the door? This little Greg just seems so cute compared to the Alpha. Just a little guy. Maybe that's the sound he makes. I don't know why. It's weird. I blame it on meds, but I'm not on meds right now for pain, so can't be that. It's just my crazy brain. Crazy brain. Um, Krug, another comment. Uh, I binged all of Into the Mist Season 1 in one week in preparation for me running the game, so thank you again for what you do. It has helped my game tremendously. Well, Krug, you are so, so welcome. Um, hopefully you got some new ideas. I mean, I've purposely for Into the Mist, I have gone away from um, the, the adventure sometimes to create, kind of give it my own spin so that people watching it and know kind of the and already know the adventure or the campaign, don't feel like it's something they've seen before. I've, I've changed a bunch. In fact, this coming episode tomorrow night, when the players finally get to the Abbey. Spoiler warnings for those that have not watched it. Just cover your ears for a second. But when they finally get to the Abbey, there's something in the story, in the narrative, that is in the adventure that I've tweaked a little bit so see if you guys can catch it um i've added my own little flair to it i think actually it was inspired by a gentleman who does into the mist stuff on youtube can't remember what his name is offhand i can't remember what the channel is but he if you look up curse of strahd he gives a bunch of kind of like walkthroughs and stuff and he suggested something for the abbey that i was like oh that is creepy and quite scary and uh and i'm gonna i'm gonna implement that so all right uh comment from jay burnham just finished the young green dragon you did great episode thank you make sure burnham if you haven't uh posted that yet be sure to post that please we'd love to see um your version of it and just make sure to tag us in that so that we can see your wonderful creations we always love to see what people come up with um and many of you have have tagged us and and we just uh, Really appreciate it and love it and love to see your creations. So, all right, this little baby Greek, little baby Greek. It's not really like a little baby. It's huge compared to like human size for miniature. But just next to the alpha, it's pretty tiny. And like I said, this is the size of the Greek. Spoiler warning for those for Curse of Strahd. This is small compared to the Grick that our party faced. Or saw. Rather, they didn't face them. They saw on the stream. Okay. Getting there slowly but surely. From the D&D &D chat. Two comments. DC Lasser. Hey, DC. Just want to say thanks to DC for a second before I read his comment. I just want to say a huge thank you for him because he is one of the mods 
um, from Dungeons and Dragons, who does such a wonderful job on their channel for us. Um, and we're so thankful, first of all. Second of all, he also goes the extra mile to kind of jump on our chat too, to say things, and he's just a really great mod. So I just want to thank DC Lissere and also Jack's Not Funny for their awesome moderation that they do on the D&D Twitch. Really appreciate it, guys. So anyways, on to the comment. I'd watch a channel that was basically Bruno Cam. <laughs> And then Trobe19 says, I would also watch Bruno Cam. He is pretty awesome. A dog, I have to say. He's got his issues. Um, his allergies are very expensive. And, uh, you know, when he's chewing his paws like that in the middle of the night, that's very annoying. Um, he is, and this is common to the breed, he's a French bulldog. And he is very um, stubborn. If he doesn't want to do something, he's not doing it unless you kind of force him to. So that's another thing. But other than that, he's pretty awesome. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Grick and Grick Alpha base coated for the most part. I think I'm going to base coat the whole thing, though. Um, so we're going to go now with a Rosy Flesh. Rosy Flesh is a just a regular game color paint color. And we're going to use that inside the mouth. Because at that point, uh, after that, we're going to um, we're just going to give it a wash with flesh tone and then or flesh wash, and then it's going to look great. So we're just shoving the rose of flesh into its maw. It's got this like really creepy beak thing, kind of like a squid beak. It's like a squid worm. Not Squidward, Squidworm. Uh, so I'm also doing kind of the web area on the side of the mouth as well. Uh, and then, like I said, when we add that flesh wash, it'll go into the recesses real nice and shade it. Um, and again, we're not doing any major sort of, um, not doing any major sort of techniques or, you know, award-winning stuff. This isn't going to, win at any award but it is going to i think look great on your table and that's kind of what we do here is we take a, a fairly simple paint job uh, and show you how to how to deliver on it i'm gonna need a smaller brush for for inside of this mouth um we take a fairly simple paint job and show you how to do it to take away some of that trepidation that people have for painting minis and show you that in the manner a manner of two hours or usually less, depending on how many minis I'm painting. Assuming I don't go crazy, like I have before, barbarians. Um, just how quickly you can get a really awesome result for your table. Okay, next, Heavy Ochre. Heavy Ochre is another extra opaque paint. Um, we're going to put some of that, and that's going to be the base for our beak on our miniature. Okay. Uh, D Nicole 32 says, asks, do you plan to do the two new hags in the new wave from WizKids? Ooh, I could absolutely potentially do that. I just looked at them. Uh, and I put them down. I'm assuming you mean the um, sea hag. And there was another one too with it. Uh, I can't remember offhand which one it is. Um, but I know what you're talking about because I had them in my hand. So from wave 12, I think. Too much water on this, it pooled a bit and I didn't like that. Okay, so we're just gonna take this heavy ochre, which is kind of close to the heavy brown, it's just a little bit more yellow. Uh, and I want the beak to be more yellow than the rest of the kind of underbelly area. I want it to stick out a bit more. that I think I'm also gonna do these give these a slight base coat of this heavy ochre and you can see that it's a little bit lighter than the heavy brown
basically, you know, when we're doing this, you know, when we when we get to the point where we're done the, I need the bigger brush for this one. It's gonna take too long this way. Um, when we're done the kind of the washes, that's sort of what the pre-painted minis kind of look like. They have sometimes they have some dry brushing, but um, whiskey's you know pre-painted are pretty awesome, especially for pre-painted minis, um, and they usually have a slight dry brush, like a wash and a slight dry brush. Um, on this show, we just take them a little bit further. So, you know, you could, like I said, leave your minis at a stage where you stop at either the base coating or a slight dry brush after this, after the wash and a slight dry brush, and they look similar to the pre-painted. And they would fit with the rest of your kind of pre-painted minis. But we just show you how to go a little bit further with these unpainted. Okay. So that's that, and then I'm going to, again, I want to use heavy ochre to kind of go over these little spikes at the end as well. These are kind of scary looking. We also got that awesome castle uh, set. I think it's called Retainers or something like that, but Whisk has just put it out. It's not a D&D &D, uh, box, but it is uh, WizKids Deep Cuts. It's got like the nobles and the king and queen and all these like dressings and stuff. It's pretty awesome. So, all right. So that is that. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and start to do the washes on them because those take a little bit of time. And then we can continue to kind of move on here. Um, oh, I didn't get... You want to make sure this is often uh, difficult or sometimes easy to forget um, is to make sure that you go a, if there's an edge a sharp edge that kind of like disappears or curves just make sure you get the kind of the top side of that edge as well because uh, sometimes it's easy to forget it miss it uh, this heavy ochre it might need a couple couple uh, coats over the green okay um, we're gonna go ahead and do a wash on this guy so we're gonna start with a black wash from Vallejo this is from the black wash from the game color line we're just gonna take that number two brush and we're going to add a little bit of water to the wash just dilute it just a bit and then we're going to go ahead and paint it over all of the green areas now if it kind of seeps onto the heavy brown it's not a huge problem but we are going to wash the heavy brown with something else so you want to try and avoid it um, but you can see here what i'm doing i'm just kind of spreading the wash on and then letting it kind of seep into the recesses in all those ridges on the Grix back. That's going to give us really nice shadow in there. Just like this. And then once that's done, of course, with this texture, uh, we could not pass up an opportunity to dry brush on this guy. Be a nice, quick awesome way to add some detail and depth to this grick it's got amazing kind of detail along the ridges in the back here which will look amazing when dry brushed so don't want to pass up that opportunity and anytime i have a creature who has this level of of, of texture on their on them i like to capitalize on that with a really nice dry brush. I'm going to do that, that also. I'm going to give that wash onto the back of the tentacles, the mouthicles. It still doesn't work. <laughs> like that. And I bet my players are, if they're watching, are happy that they didn't square off against the Grick now. So they just let it be. And that's a very 
valuable lesson in D&D for you players out there. You don't have to kill everything you see, folks. Especially when you're stuck in a crazy haunted catacombs. Sometimes if you can just keep going, yeah, just keep going to survive. Joel and I have a have a bit of a saying, and that is survival is success. And that is so very true. I heard somebody say that once. I think Joel said it actually. I don't know if he got it from him, from somebody else or or if he came up with that. But the same goes in D and D, folks. Survival is success. Sometimes, sometimes you just need to keep going. You don't want to fight that Grick because your spells and your abilities are, especially when it's just minding its business in an alcove, just chomping away on some leftovers. Just let it go. And maybe some leftover adventures, but they're dead, so really, what are you going to do? Can't really help them at this stage, right? Let's just let him have his meal and continue on your merry way. Now, who knows what happened to that Grick? Is that Grick still roaming the village of Barovia? We don't know. Stay tuned to find out. I love that my players now think that if they can watch the show, maybe there's some foreshadowing about what they're going to face. We painted uh, we painted these flesh golems last time, and, uh, and the players are like, oh, are we facing flesh golems? I said, we'll find out. Stay tuned. They haven't yet. So maybe they won't. And maybe me painting in this Grick is just a, just a curveball. Maybe it's a distraction. Who knows? I do. All right. Back to questions. I'm just really falling back on the questions here. I am going to use, though, sepia wash. Wherever that is. Here it is. Sepia wash. Um, or sepia shade, uh, rather, which is a wash that I will use for all of the heavy brown and heavy ochre areas that we painted. We're just going to, again, and wash, I've said it before, you don't really paint it on, you kind of manipulate it on, right? You, you, you apply it by painting it on. But then what you're doing is you're letting it kind of pool and then you're moving it around the area until it rests in those recesses. Um, until you're happy with kind of the coverage for it. And you can already see how the washes are really bringing out the detail in this miniature. Camera seems okay today, folks. Eh? It's a little bit jittery, but better, I think. Just applying this across all of the heavy brown areas here. And like I said, all across the heavy ochre as well. Add a little bit of water to it just to allow it to flow. The the washes in the Vallejo range tend to be fairly um, potent, um, which is great because sometimes it calls for that. And of course, it's easier to dilute a wash or a color than it is to uh, add to it. You can't really make it more opaque unless you add color or paint or something, and that's just, that's just a lot of work, so. Now, again, this wash, I'm putting it onto the beak, I'm allowing it to kind of settle in the recesses. Uh, and there aren't, what recesses I mean is like where it meets the rest of the grick as well. I'm just making sure it kind of goes on and then rests to create some delineation. Getting a little stuffy, hope I'm not coming down with a cold. I add the wash to the little spikes as well. And there we go. You can see, folks, how killer that looks. 
with just some wash on there. And it's not about technique, folks. In this situation, it's, well, it's not about talent, I should say. It's about technique. It's just about the coverage and not just slopping it on, but kind of moving into the recess and just manipulating it a bit. It's very easy. It's a simple technique. Just making sure it doesn't pull too much uh, so that it hides the detail, but accentuates it. If it rests too much on the edge of something that it's not supposed to, we, we kind of move it around until it goes where we want it to. There we go. This little guy's get done a lot faster than the other guy. That's for sure. For sure. Okay. There. Imagine like one of these guys, you just go into your backyard and just rears up and opens his mouth like that. All right, so those washes are done. Uh, one more wash we gotta do, and then we're just gonna let it sit for a second. It's the flesh wash. The flesh wash. Um, is a great wash for flesh colors, or I like using it for things like this, where it needs to kind of rest in a mouth area, something that needs to look kind of natural and skin toned or like flesh. And so I'm just going to add it in here. And you can see what it did already to that area. It's adding some depth to the inside of the beak and the other side as well. So we're just going to let that sit because that is going to have to dry both that one and the baby Grick. Like that. Now this flesh wash has to go a little bit heavier because it's not quite as opaque as the others. So there. I don't think that was quite dry enough, so it just did bleed a little bit, but that's okay. All right. Let that sit for a bit, folks. Let's answer some questions. What do you think? All right. Um, Sodius asks, is that paint diluted? What kind of paint is it? Um, I'm assuming you mean the, the washes are not diluted, uh, are, are diluted. But it's a wash that's so formulated specifically to be a bit waterier, so that it is thinner, so that it goes into the recesses. Uh, and the regular paints aren't. I have to I dilute them with a little bit of water all the time. That's kind of what I do with all of my Vallejo paints. Is what I'm using. From the D and D chat, um, Polytechnics asks, "Have you done a lot of the scenery yet?" Uh, I've done some of the scenery for the WizKids line. That isn't Nolzer scenery mostly. Um, so we don't do them on this show, although maybe sometime I will, uh, on, an, on another show, but I have done the wagons. So we did the, um, Esmeralda's wagons for Into the Mist. I don't have them here right now. They're not really within reach, but, um, but we did some of that. I love painting scenery personally. So maybe at some point we'll paint more of it, um, when we get the opportunity to do so. Um, did you get sent the huge, chunky bra uh, dragon of black ice? I have not yet, but it's awesome. And you saw the size of these ones. That one's going to be huge, too. Um, Tanerm54 asks, Jason, I would love to see what you do with the fur on the Wave 12 Jackalware minis. I looked at those today, and I may do them. Maybe we'll do them next week. You are a wonderful inspiration. In fact, I'm painting with you right now. Thanks so much. Tanerm, me. Thank you. That means so much. I'm glad. And I, I, that's where I want to get to. I know I don't say them or announce them quick enough. I know Julian was on my butt today to make sure that we got the mods, the, um, the minis that we were painting today. Uh, but I uh, need to do that more um, and want to do that more. Uh, while these are drying, I might as well go widescreen on this so that you guys so we can chat. Uh, anyways, but I, my intention for this is really to at some point get to the point where you guys are painting the minis with me while I paint. That would be the ultimate. I know some of you already do it. I'd like to know if any of you are painting the Grick while I am here. Um, and we used to, we used to um, post a month in advance of Nolzers. I think we'll start to do that again. 
I really want to. That is my hope. So let's hope that we can get there. Uh, we can get there again. Question from Dag Crystal asks, to be able to play it like a game, how to make homebrew races and items, things like that, so we can use the rules of D&D &D to roleplay with... So yeah, so you can absolutely do that in D&D &D Beyond. Uh, you just create homebrew items. Uh, you can. I don't know if you can actually... You can do races, I think. You can do monsters. You can do items. So just check out the homebrew section of D&D &D Beyond, and you can absolutely do that. I haven't done that a lot, but I've done it some. Oso B Paints. I th welcome back. Any suggestion for getting out of painting rut, finding motivation to keep painting? Absolutely. Um, I would say that the easiest way to kind of do that for me is to keep painting that some things that have a purpose in your game. So for me, it's way easier for me to paint things that I'm using, I'm going to use in, in future sessions, um, as opposed to things that just kind of, or things that I want to paint. So that's an easy, sounds like an easy solution, but it's not always. Definitely paint stuff that you are excited about painting and that will push you to continue to paint. If you're painting stuff that, because you have to, um, sometimes that creates a rut and you're, and you, uh, not as fun. Definitely not as fun and not as inspiring. Um, for this Grick, I don't know if I'll need it necessarily, uh, but the players kind of uh, faced one and so it kind of, got a bit of a or saw one so it had a bit of a close kind of connection to me in my heart uh and so i decided that maybe i should paint it um and y'all could enjoy it as well it's taking a little while with these washes uh, um question from adabel rosette what is your favorite feature about the grick great question what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to pull a Grick here, perhaps. Uh, I don't have my creature cards. I don't think I have him in my creature cards, so I'm going to have to pull him up in D&D Beyond. Let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, type in Grick. We'll read him through, and then I'll let you know what my favorite. Because I know they, they do some pretty cool stuff. So, um, Grick. I won't look at the alpha just yet. The regular Grick is challenge two. Um, the multi-attack. Grick makes one attack with its tentacles. And it can make a beak attack if that attack hits. So if, if the tentacles hit, then it can make a beak attack against the same target. It has the tentacles and it has a beak. Tentacles do slashing damage. A beak does piercing damage. Makes sense. Um, stone camouflage. The Grick has advantage on dexterity checks made to hide in rocky terrain. Interesting. Resistances to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. It's important to know that. Got dark vision up to 60 feet. But other than that, it is pretty... Pretty... Um, kind of... Uh, stand, not standard, but doesn't have any other crazy abilities. Uh, the worm-like monstrosity blends in with the rock of the caverns it haunts. When prey comes near, it, its barbed tentacles unfurl to re reveal its hungry, snapping beak. Um, the worm-like grick waits unseen, blending in with the rock of the caves and caverns it haunts. Only when prey comes near does it rear up its four barbed tentacles unfurling to relieve its hungry, snapping beak, which is exactly what I just read. I think they have... Oh, no, it's not exactly, but it has it twice. They're passive... Predators, Gricks rarely hunt. Instead, they drag their rubbery bodies to places where creatures regularly pass. So, in this situation, they didn't get close enough to the Grick, so the Grick didn't attack. As it is uh, neutral aligned. Uh, roving ambushers, Gricks remain in an area until the food supply dwindles, often because sentient creatures become aware of their presence and plot alternate routes around their layers. Over time, Grick layers accumulate the cast off possessions of intelligent prey an expert guides how to look out for these telltale signs. So that is a Grick. I'm going to break up the Grick Alpha real quick. A Grick Alpha is challenge rating 7. Uh, stone camouflage as well. It has a multi attack, but it makes two attacks, one with its tail and one with its tentacles. If it hits with its tentacles, the Grick can make one beak attack against the same target. But it also has a tail attack. Um, so, yeah, if it hits, it can also make a beak attack. 
So it can hit with its tail and its tentacles. If it hits with the tentacles, so it really gets three attacks if it's successful. The tail uh, it does 2d6 plus four damage. Tentacles do 4d8 plus four. And the beak does 2d8 plus four. Wow. But other than that, pretty much all the same stats. I don't know why I'm... I'm old, folks. It's just the way it is. Yeah, so that's the Grick and the Grick Alpha. Uh, my favorite part is the fact that they're kind of... Um, my favorite part, I think, is that they're kind of passive creatures, that they don't just attack stuff um, nilly, uh, willy-nilly, uh, that they're kind of smart in the way that they hunt. Uh, and they're just terrifying. The idea of this worm-like thing with like this, and then it just rah, opens up is pretty scary. Um, kind of like the creatures in... Stranger Things, I guess, a little bit. That's what it reminds me of anyways. Okay. All right, so this is still drying. These washes do take a little while. You can see it's still kind of wet in the recesses. So we're just going to wait a little bit longer. Still got lots of time here. We're going to be done early, I think, folks, which is cute. Uh, the little guy is more dry than the big guy. So I think I'll start with the little guy. Um, we're going to take the dry brush. It's a number four brush from Vallejo. It's got a wider, a kind of wider, more um, hard bristles or, or rigid bristles, I should say. And I am using Cayman Green for the highlight on the back. It's kind of a natural sort of earthy green, almost like an olive color. So we're just going to take that, load our brush, Dry brushing for those that are new to it. Basically, you're taking the color, loading your brush, and then wiping it off until you're getting hardly any residue on the paper towel. And then you're just going to against the grain, so not with it. What that means is against the texture you can see here, I'm brushing it on. And it is catching the, on the detail of and the texture like that. There we go. Really simple technique with really great effect. If you guys can see that or not. It's subtle, but it works. Okay, so that's the first one. Like I said, from here on in, it's going to go pretty quick. Now, the Grick Alpha, you'll see it a lot more. And then we're going to do another level of highlight on here as well. This one is an all over kind of dry brush highlight. We're gonna go basically across the entirety of the Grick surface of the green, so the entirety of the back. You can see how that's highlighting nicely. Man, I love this texture, this worm-like texture for this. It just really makes it pop. We're gonna do that right across. I'm being careful not to get the areas where the wash isn't totally dry yet. That's just gonna make a mess. Uh, but the areas that the wash isn't dry are kind of in the recesses, so it's the areas that we wouldn't necessarily go to anyways. Again, again we're going against the grain so that it catches all of the ridges. Like that. Okay. Now, in the monster manual, he's kind of, kind of subdued. He's not really, um, and you want him to look natural for the sake of camouflage. So he's not going to be like super bright green or anything like that. So I think I'm going to use some bone white to add to this Cayman green. I'm going to mix them probably one to one together here like this that's a good color there now again I'm gonna wipe that off mostly on here uh, comes out to like a green gray almost color and then with that I'm gonna go ahead and just across the middle of his back add that dry brush and you can see because again we're just now focusing on the areas where the light would hit I'm not doing down here too much on the back here where the light would really hit on the tip of the tail. And I'm kind of sticking to the middle of the Grick. 
just the center kind of area here. So on the tentacles as well. Here on the top of the tentacles, not the center, because again, this is where the light would kind of shine the most. There. And you can see kind of how what that did. Really brought out that that texture. Oh, that looks good. Really cool. Okay. Really like that color. I mean, like I said, that's an equal parts mix of bone white and Cayman green. Doing the same on the little guy. This is going to take like two seconds, almost. Not quite, but close. And that's done. Okay. Dry your, uh, uh, rinse your brush. Now you want to let that dry as much as possible between dry brushes now because we don't want it to be wet. Adabel Rosette has a question comment. My group just dealt with the night hags at Bone Grinder Mill. Oh, they were fun. That was two episodes ago. For those of you, again, I'm sorry if there's spoilers for those of you who have already watched, who have not watched the first um, season, or sorry, the second season yet because you're catching up. I apologize for the for the spoilers. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to heavy ochre and just see if I, yeah, I should do that first. So I'm just doing a heavy ochre dry brush here on the belly. And then I'm going to kind of lighten that up with a pale yellow. And then probably add bone white to that pale yellow for an added final highlight. But this is already kind of really lightening that area. Making sure not to dry brush onto the green. Want to stay off that, of course, as we're already done. And this is just bringing that bone white back kind of to the surface of the detail. I'm going to do something here, here for the kind of the suction cups, the tentacles, a little bit on. There we go. Okay. Do that on the little guy too. At this point, we're moving so fast. I don't bother putting them in the little figure holder. Keep hitting the camera, sorry guys. Okay, now we're gonna take an equal part mix of pale yellow. And so we're gonna take what we have left on the palette for our heavy ochre, put about the same amount of heavy yellow on there. And then we're just gonna mix it together mixing onto the heavy ochre side a bit more. This might be too bright, but we're gonna find out. Question uh, from Shatzer. Did the players come across Mama Grick or Baby Grick, or can you tell us? Uh, so spoilers, cover your ears. Uh, they came across a regular Grick, so the medium sized one. Um, but maybe a Mama Grick exists, you never know. So now I'm carefully dry brushing this pale yellow heavy ochre mix just along the uppermost areas of the detail. Staying away kind of from the areas that would be in the most shadow, like down there, and just painting it onto the areas that would catch the light the most. Upper edge of the bottom here, um, and especially this belly area, because obviously that would be the most. But you can see how the color, man, this is, love minis like this that have so much so much wonderful opportunity for detail. So get those suction cups as well. And then I'm also going to do the little spikes with this mix a bit. And the also going to do the beak as well a bit with that mix. Uh, and I know we used heavy brown originally. But here, this yellow, or the he using the heavy ochre a bit on this, really will bring out some nice colors on this belly. And I think that the color on the, in the Monster Manual is a bit more subdued, but we do want it to feel... It's kind of hard to catch these smaller details, but it's working. Okay, there we go. 
baby group. Done. Now I did wipe off, I think, some of this on the back side here. So I'm just going to touch that up a bit. You have to be careful when touching these um, because the um, until it's fully cured, sometimes you pull the paint off. You want to be careful with that. Okay. I think that's bright enough on the back side. Front is good. Back, I like it. Uh, at this point, I think I'm going to work up the color on the beak. Uh, I think that mouth is really coming along. It's not dry yet, but it's really coming along. So I'm just going to pop this guy in here. And I'm now going to take that heavy yellow, heavy ochre kind of mix, and I'm going to paint. I'm going to dilute it a bit. Multiple thin coats is always better. I'm just going to paint it onto the beak like this here. Focus kind of on the top area, the the, the the most prominent areas and leaving that other mix in the just in the recesses where it meets the rest. Like that. You really want that. You really want that beak to pop. Make it look fierce. Make sure you get the edge. Like that. I'm also going to paint this mix onto the spikes. Like that. And I'm just going to run the edge of my brush carefully. See, if you're not careful, that happens. But I'm going to wipe most of the paint off and just rub the edge of my brush along the tentacles to try and highlight those. Now, I, I made a bit of a boo-boo there. Um, the way I would fix that, see, now it's okay because I, I had too much paint on my brush before. But you can see how that one worked. The other one, not as good because I had too much paint. So now if you wipe up most of the paint, you can see what that's doing to those tentacles, really bringing it out. Same here, we do the same. Like that. Finish painting it on the edge here. These spikes, there we go. There we go, perfect. Killer. Might just put a little bit more here, just brush it along the center. There. Now I'm gonna fix that little boo-boo by cleaning my brush. You can see how I clean my brush. I kind of twist it to make sure I maintain that, that peak. I'm just gonna grab a bit more sepia wash and just paint it around that boo-boo. And that should make it go away for the most part. Okay. Um, I didn't do that to this one, so I'm going to do that to the small guy. We just did. Get this beak done. It's not as big on the small one, so you just got to be a bit more careful. You don't paint it onto the flesh areas. He has kind of like a Muppet mouth, I feel. I feel like he belongs kind of on the Muppet somehow. I don't know why. It's weird. <laughs> okay, we're going to get these spikes. There we go. And then I'm going to do the same thing where I'm going to wipe up most of that paint and then just run it along the inside to try and catch some of those ridges and those it's not going to be as good as a larger one, but there we go. Definitely caught some of those tentacles. Okay. Now what I'm going to do, pretty close to, to done here, except for the base, um, which is going to be fairly simple. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a bone white, paint it in alongside the um, 
the pale yellow that I still have here on my palette, and then I'm going to mix that bone white with that pale yellow. Like that. Add a little bit of water to dilute it here. Create a nice kind of point to my brush. And then I'm going to run that along the ridge of the beak. And I'm also going to run it kind of just along the top here, the beak on the bottom, and like that. That looks nice and sharp and scary. I'm also going to kind of hit the tip of these of these kind of spikes. And I think that's kind of it for for that. I also added a um, you can see from the paint list the beginning. I also added uh, a gloss of varnish. The reason I did that, I'm not going to use it on the episode. But the reason I did it was because that is, you can see how that, that beak now really stands out. The reason I did that is because I'm going to be using it after I use the matte varnish from Vallejo. Uh, I'm going to be using it on the areas that would be kind of slimy and wet. So inside the mouth, maybe on some of the um, tentacles, but definitely in this area, I want it to feel slimy and wet and I am going to use the gloss varnish in there so that it looks that way and you get the kind of feel. Um, what I would also say is, um, you know, you could even use, I use a glue gun to do it, to create kind of strings of slobber that go across the beak and maybe to the tentacles would be really cool. And I just use a glue gun, I kind of connect it to one side, let it dry a bit, then pull it down to different places and create kind of slobber that way. I'm going to go ahead and use heavy blue gray to paint the base. At this point, I'm going to be really careful handling it because I don't want to pull any paint off, but I do need to access the edges. So I'm gingerly kind of holding the mini so as not to ruin the paint job I just created. Then after this heavy blue-gray um, coat, which again, you have to be very careful in the base. Don't want to get it onto the body of the, of the Grick that you just expertly painted. Um, but you do want to get it down right up to the edge of the Grick for sure. So make sure you get the edges here. And after, we're just going to give it a the base of black wash. You could decide that after the black wash, you can uh, dry brush it with some bone white if you wanted to. But the black wash will help to kind of delineate the grick from its base um, and add some depth to kind of like the texture on the base as well, that, that stone texture. But this just finishes off the grick nicely. Being careful not to touch the edges here as much as possible. Make sure you allow that base coat then on the stone to dry before you touch that again. So I'm just going to put that there. And then the big guy. It's kind of hard to get the brush in here. You could also base coat. I never like base coating the, the bases just because I like to get to the fun stuff. A little impatient that way. But, um, but you can definitely allow... And you can base coat the base when you base coat everything else. There's no real order to it. Um, I like to base coat <clears throat> most minis in in their entirety, and then do all the the washing and stuff. The reason I do that, for the most part, most of the time, the reason I do that is because I like to wash, use a wash on as many like surfaces that will be similar colors as possible, right? So if you know that you're going to use CPO wash on like five different areas, base coat all of those and then do the wash if you want uh, before you do the rest. I also sometimes consider what I'm going to dry brush the most. <clears throat> and if there are areas that need the most dry brush, then I'm going to make sure that I uh, dry brush or, or base coat the areas and dry, dry brush the whole thing so you don't have to be careful and then come in and, uh, and do that. Uh, 
let me see here. Just coming in to some more questions. Uh, from the D&D chat, Lemil, Lemil Velo. Welcome. I haven't seen that before. We've got a comment. Dry brushing is one of my favorite things to learn for painting. It makes a big difference, and it's not hard to do. So true, especially with the right uh, texture. Roman Wolf, now paint every suction cup a color. <laughs> oh, don't tempt me. Uh, Adabel Rosette says, love dry brushing. My group burned down the mill, but one head got away. Woo! Uh, I won't tell you what happened with us, but similar. Uh R. Burnham says, the WizKids 73201 Tiefling Sorcerer would be a mini I would like to see. Okay, I'll remember that. Tiefling Sorcerer 3201. Uh, Roman Wolf asks, does Vallejo do basing materials? Do you, do you do the base or keep it only paint and wash? Good question. So they do have basing materials. Um, some of their brush-on base stuff is awesome. They're called environment effects, um, and they're amazing. Um, it's basically like a textured paint that you paint onto bases to give it kind of a sandy texture. Um, WizKids often has a textured base, so I don't feel the need to do that um, onto it, like to add sand or anything like that. What I do use sometimes um, is their grass tufts, which for this guy, I don't know if I will because it's supposed to be like underground subterranean stone. So I don't think I'm going to use that for this. Maybe I will. Maybe if it's like a... Maybe like a dried out brush or something, but they have amazing, I don't have any of them here because I took them all away, but they do have amazing little grass tufts that they're releasing. They should be out now, I think. I know they were coming out in the summer, but check those out. Um, but, but that, I'm going to say, folks, is a wrap on the Grick because that is going to take some time to dry before I can put the wash on that base. But you put a black wash on it, a little dry brush, but that is a wrap on the Grick Alpha. And a wrap on the Grick. Oh, little dude. So fun. I got one more question I'll answer. Any advice for DMing an endless dungeon crawl? I'm planning on running the dungeon of the Mad Mage. Ooh. Um, yes, my biggest suggestion for a big dungeon that never ends is you have to find ways to make it interesting for the player. So just because it's a dungeon doesn't mean it has to be all dungeon-esque, right? It could have a little, like, hidden underground pools or caverns, uh, even, like, an underground forest kind of thing, mystical kind of thing, maybe even areas where it, like, <clears throat> dips into the different elemental planes. Uh, so fire, lava, even the Feywild, like, different, like, rifts and things. Um, what I would say, though, is you definitely need to mix it up to make it interesting, um, that all of your encounters shouldn't be combat encounters. So you definitely want to make sure that you mix it up so that uh, it doesn't all feel like combat, just monsters in the dungeon. Um, you know, what, what created this dungeon? Why was it built? Who were the people that created it? Is it an ancient dungeon? Was it created by the elves? Was it created by the dwarves? Um, and have kind of those interesting sort of elements built in. I know Mad Mage is, is great as a, as a, I've been told it's really great. I haven't run it myself, but it'll give you lots of kind of like ideas like that, but just make sure that you have lots of opportunity for the players to talk, to hang out, to kind of camp out in the dungeon. Um, but make sure that you mix it up. And that is kind of the key of running any dungeon. Uh, it can be, feel really monotonous, um, it even took us a long time to go through Death House, the catacombs in the Death House. That was a dungeon. Um, but again, mixing it up and making sure that you have different types of creatures, different types of environments, different types of encounters. Um, maybe some of them are spoken encounters. Maybe they meet goblins or kobolds who don't want to fight, who just want to discuss, who want help creating, uh, defeating some larger creature um, that exists that threatens kind of their life, their well-being and their life. Um, but balance and diversity is the spice of life and the spice of a dungeon <laughs> or any campaign, frankly, uh, actually. So that is my suggestion for running an endless dungeon. Thank you so much guys for watching. It has been a blast, uh, doing another episode. This is again, 53. So we have lots of episodes. If you want to see the VODs for these, you can check them out at our YouTube page. It's youtube.com slash realmsmith. We have 53 different creatures, monsters, um, elements that you can take a look at. We've had so much fun with all of them. Um, 
We uh, can't wait to have you back tomorrow night for Into the Mist, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Uh, what you see in front of you is the Abbey of St. Markovia, who hopefully they'll get to. They're supposed to get their last session. That didn't happen. But they will have special guest Matt Lillard as Rictavio join us. Um, and he will, in the break, we'll do an, a bit of an interview and talk about um, their new Curse of Strahd legendary box, which looks amazing. And the ways in which we'll be using some of the elements in that box during our campaign um, leading into October, which is where... Um, basically, uh, Halloween weekend will be the finale of Into the Mist Season 2. So we've got lots left to go, 16 episodes in all, and we are so stinking excited to be a part of it and to um, have you guys along for the ride. Tomorrow, uh, Tuesday night, we'll be behind the screen with myself. You can ask all questions that you didn't get to ask tonight, but even about sessions and Realmsmith in general and how we do things, and then Players Table on Thursday. I'm thinking about having a, a guest for Behind the Screen. So stay tuned for that. Hope you guys enjoyed yourselves. We have half an hour uh, in our time left, but I like to keep these short so that the VODs are succinct as well. Um, and the more succinct they are, the better they are for the viewers uh, who watch them after the fact. So um, enjoy your Gricks. Uh, make sure that they um, challenge your players, scare the crap out of them as they are super creepy creatures. And you guys have a wonderful night. We'll see you tomorrow night. Peace.